Hello, I'm Sherry Sturman, Director of Crail Education. I'm excited about today's Crayola Art of Learning program, which will thrill animal lovers and nature fans. Art helps children learn about the world around them. Today, we're going to explore animals and biomes using art. So gather your students or your family, grab some art supplies, and get ready for a hands-on learning session. I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Kiki Myhawk, who is a wildlife educator, science communicator, conservationist, and artist. Kiki, please tell us how you turned your childhood love for animals into a multifaceted career that has included being a zookeeper, conservation educator, and founder of Peachy Giraffe Graphics. What is the thread that has woven through your career journey? For me, it's been passion. Ever since I was a little girl, I've just been so fascinated by wildlife and just passionate about learning as much as I could possibly cram into my brain about them. And so for me, just that passion and leaning into it and following it throughout my life, wherever it led me, whatever crazy job opportunities or things that would come up where I could work with animals, it was all just following and leaning into that passion and letting it take me where it was meant to take me. And, uh, and it's led me through, as you said, being a zookeeper and being a conservation educator and doing graphic designs for wildlife and just everything now. So speaking of conservation educators, this is a group of teachers who often teach in natural settings instead of typical classrooms and shift the curriculum based on what nature decides to spotlight at any given time. Please explain what it means to be a conservation educator and tell us about one of your favorite unexpected lessons that you were teaching in an informal setting when nature provided a rich opportunity for learning right there on the spot. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Lots of times when I'm teaching about wildlife, I have to be ready for formal and informal settings. Formal settings are like a classroom and everybody's in their desk and they're paying attention. And informal settings are you're walking through an environment and you're letting them inform how you're teaching to your students what an animal is exhibiting as a behavior at that time. And you're letting that inform what you're going to talk to the students about. Something that actually happened pretty recently, I was taking a group of students whitewater rafting and we were sitting underneath this awning waiting to get debriefed about all the safety measures for whitewater rafting and I turned and I looked next to me and there was a creek that was running by and we were waiting for the person to come and tell us how to not you know die on the whitewater rafting trip and so I looked at this creek and I thought that's a really healthy looking creek I bet there's salamanders in there and so I told some of the students I said hey I'm gonna go find some salamanders that's a really healthy looking creek come on like come look with me and so I took two of the students and they were planning on just whitewater rafting that day, but we wound up finding five different salamanders and just working with all of them. And I was talking to the students about it and just showing them the different salamanders. And it was really fun. It was a cool moment to just kind of interp with them and teach them about the wildlife that we had just wound up finding in the creek next to us. I love hearing about these nature inspired improvisational moments where, you know, forget the planned curriculum, lean into whatever creature comes your way. And speaking of creatures, you enjoy teaching about what could be thought of as underappreciated animals. Those creatures where people might say yuck or ooh, without really appreciating the beauty of them, such as maybe sloths, snakes, skunks. You believe that every animal has a superpower that's fun to learn about. Please share some fun facts about one or two of your favorite underappreciated animals to help get us excited about learning more about them. One of my favorite underappreciated animals to talk about is actually naked mole rats. And that's because I used to underappreciate them. I was teaching a walk at a zoo and I had to take my students to go see the naked mole rats. And I was like, ah, who cares about the naked mole rats? They're not that cute. I don't want to talk about them, but to prepare myself because I was going to talk to the students about it, I went and started reading up about them. And I found out that they live up to 
their 30s and they're naturally immune to cancer because of chemical compounds in their body. And when a female naked mole rat becomes the new queen, her vertebrae in her lower back expand and she actually lengthens and grows larger in size so that she can have huge litters of up to 30 pups in one litter. It's crazy. And so she can actually almost double in size just because she became the queen and just because she started having all of these pups. So I've just found that the more I investigate animals, whether it's learning about snakes or learning to appreciate spiders, because that was something I had to overcome, the more that I investigate these animals and ask questions about them, the more I find out there's just crazy, fascinating stuff to talk about with all of them. And they're all really worth talking about because it's super interesting stuff. And then I can't wait to tell other people about it once I learn about it. That is fascinating. A litter of 30 pups. Wow. And that her body changes in such a way. Fascinating. Kika, when we met, you explained that you love project-based learning, which is an approach to education that awakens that inner child in people of all ages, because they use new information to create something that they are interested in. So while many of the animals and biomes that you teach can't really be touched directly, tell us why it's important to weave this hands-on discovery, creative approach to these projects into your lessons and why you avoid a lecture or a look but don't touch approach. I found that project-based learning is a great way to connect children and adults with animals because I think it's hard to beat a personal experience. It's hard to beat having some skin in the game and something hands-on. It's tactile. You've you've done it yourself, it helps connect more parts of your brain. Because if you're talking about something and you're seeing it get molded together and you're forming it, you're doing kinesthetic learning, you're doing listening, you're speaking it, maybe you write out how you're going to do the project. And so you're having to use all these different parts of learning to create something It makes it so much more memorable. And it makes it personal because Whatever you create in that project-based learning is a representation of how you understand the material. So it's a personal thing about your connection to the subject. For me, it's just really important to incorporate that because it's a way to make learning more accessible and more inclusive to how everybody learns and give everybody an option to really grasp it instead of just doing auditory or just doing reading or just doing writing. Love your explanation that project-based learning awakens the brain with personal relevance. Thank you. We're excited for you to show us the first art demo, camouflage and an ecosystem. So let's start by having you explain what camouflage is and why it's so important for animal survival. How do creatures adapt so they blend in with their surroundings? And then, of course, this will set the stage for your paper weaving art demo. For animals, they rely on camouflage as a way to stay alive. So what we're doing today is making a demo of a biome and we're going to make the animal blend in with it. Now, I know sometimes there's different animals that they don't blend in with their environment, like say a coral snake, it's bright red. Well, he's not trying to blend in because he's trying to warn other animals that he's venomous, but for pretty much everything else that's not venomous and can't protect itself with venom, it's gonna try to blend in with its environment. So what I'm gonna draw right now is an underwater scene. I'm gonna draw the ocean, and then I'm gonna draw an animal that blends into the ocean and talk to you about why it is the color that it is and how that helps it survive within the ocean. So I've got some areas under the water. I've got some places that fish could hide and I'm gonna do some bubbles. So you could draw an underwater scene. You could draw a desert, you could draw a jungle. In fact, I drew a desert and a jungle. I'm gonna show it to you later, but right now we're just gonna draw our underwater scene. So you're gonna make your scene, you're gonna make your environment. And then on a separate sheet of paper, what I want you to do is draw an animal that lives in that environment. For me, I'm gonna draw a blue whale that lives underwater. So this is mine. I'm just gonna draw a big whale and I'm using the same crayon that I started with because what color are blue whales? They're blue like the ocean. Now, if you've noticed on a whale, their underside is normally white. And I want you to take a second and try to think about why would a whale be blue on top and white on the bottom? 
because isn't it trying to blend in with the ocean and it's blue all through. Well, then I want you to imagine yourself in a swimming pool and looking up from underneath the water, you're going to see the sunlight through the top of the swimming pool and it's going to be white coming through the water. So because of that, a blue whale, when you look at it from underneath the water, you don't see it. It's camouflaged with the sunlight that's above it. When you look at it from any other angle, from the side or from above, it's going to blend in with the blue water. Now, after you've drawn your animal and you've finished drawing and coloring in your water scene or your jungle, I'm going to have you cut out your animal. You're going to shade in your animal. I'm going to make my nice and blue and I'm going to leave his underside more or less white. It just has those little stripes on it. It's my little blue whale. And then for my ocean scene, I'm going to add some more color to it. I'm going to add a darker blue and I'm going to add some green for the kelp that I drew. Now, if I was a little green fish, this is where I would live. I would live in the kelp. So I'm coloring in the different parts of the ocean. Now maybe I need a little sand for the bottom of the ocean. And now it's time to make our ocean blue. Maybe I'll use this darker color for the middle, more like a purple. Now you'll take out this page and you can use reg regular paper or you could use Crayola cardstock if you would prefer that. But now we're gonna cut our animal out. And then I'm gonna tell you what to do, so. Now other animals you could do that live in the ocean. Like I said, you could do a little green fish that lives in the kelp. There's so many colors in the ocean. There's orange corals and pink corals and all sorts of different colors. And the thing about that is for every color that you see in the ocean, there's an animal that's that color and it lives in that thing. So you could draw an orange coral and then you could draw an orange seahorse that lives in the coral. Or you could draw a pink piece of seagrass and then you could draw a little pink octopus that lives inside of it because all of these animals are adapted with their camouflage to protect them from predators finding them and eating them. So it's a pretty good strategy to avoid getting eaten to just be invisible. So I'm almost done cutting out my little blue whale or big blue whale. Blue whales are actually the length of a basketball court. And even when they're a baby, a newborn baby blue whale is 25 feet long. They are huge. They weigh already thousands of pounds at birth. So now that you've cut out your animal and you have your scene, you're going to fold your scene in half lengthwise. And then you're gonna take your scissors and we're gonna cut slits across. Now don't go all the way across. You're only gonna cut about this high. Okay, so about an inch from the edge. Enough length that you can fit your animal in, but not enough that the paper is gonna rip. Now, I've got all my little slits cut. I'm gonna unfold my paper and press it flat and be gentle because it's got lots of cuts in it right now. Now we're gonna take our animal and we're gonna weave it in. And look at our little blue whale, he disappeared. That's cause he doesn't wanna be seen by anybody. So we can see our blue whale is blended in. And some other environments that you can make, I made a couple earlier, I'll show you. You could make a desert scene. I put some dunes in mine and I put some cacti and then I cut my slits and then I drew a little camel. Now when he goes into the desert and it's kind of funny because I drew pyramids and his hump almost looks like a pyramid so he really blends in. We're going to weave him in to his environment, hide him in there as if he's hiding from a predator. And he's gone. He's disappeared. And then the last one that I have is a rainforest. So with the rainforest, 
I did a leopard. So I did lots and lots of leaves. And then the most important thing with this is that all of the spots are the shadows from the leaves. And that's what a leopard camouflages into. He relies on all of the shadows from all of the leaves to blend in with his spots. So when he hides behind a bush and he hides underneath a tree, he blends into his environment and he disappears into the shadows. That's something you can do with just crayons and paper and a pair of scissors. I love how you wove science information about the biomes and the camouflage into the art project. Fantastic. So for our second art demo, we're excited to have you show us how to do animal footprint stamps. So please use Model Magic and show kids how they can create a stamp. And there might be different footprints that they're interested in. Maybe the kinds of animals who would come alongside a creek, perhaps a deer, a raccoon, a fox, or a dog, a pet might also run down in the woods and, and sip up some of the creek water. I have with me a picture of some different animal prints that you might see. If you went to a riverbed, you might see that a little white-tailed deer came down and he drank some water there. Or you might see a red fox's footprints, or you might see a mountain lion. And a big difference here is a red fox has claws and a coyote has claws that you can see in its footprint. Whereas a mountain lion, just like a little household cat, it retracts its claws. So its claws can go inside of its foot. So when it's walking, those claws are retracted. And that's how we can tell a cat footprint from a dog footprint. Some other footprints you might see would be a raccoon footprint, a back black bear footprint. There's lots of different wildlife that we might see visit a riverbed. So what I've done is I've drawn my little riverbed scene. I've got water coming up and I put some rocks and this is my sand. Now I already made a couple footprint stamps already, but we're gonna make one together. So I have my model magic and I'm gonna make a deer footprint. So I've got a picture of a deer footprint. I'm gonna look at my picture of a deer footprint and I'm gonna form my stamp. So first I'd like to make a little handle like this and then I press it down so it's a little easier to grip like that so it's tapered and now we need to make the footprint so what you want to think about with your stamp is the part that you're stamping needs to stick out the most so we're going to push I'm going to push in the middle because my deer footprint has a hole down the middle and I'm going to start forming that footprint got my little raccoon footprint and I'm going to dip it in some brown paint because lots of times the animals would get into some mud. So I'm going to press his little toes down and make my little print. There's my little raccoon footprint. Just a little guy. And then I'm going to use my little coyote footprint as well. You can see I've got little nails sticking out because it's a coyote, so his nails don't go back inside of his paw. They stay out. So this is a mountain lion, right? So it doesn't have any claws poking out. And this is a coyote footprint. So this is kind of what I modeled mine out of. It could be, it kind of looks like a red fox one as well, but I just kind of modeled it after that. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to make sure I get my nails down when I make my little footprint so that everybody knows I'm doing a dog footprint. And you can see those little nail tips. So if you're looking by a creek and you see a footprint with all of the little toes, but no nails, we would know that it's a cat. But if we see the toes with nails, we know it's a coyote or a red fox or a wolf or your neighbor's dog. But we know it's one of those. So that's my little river scene. You have inspired us all to want to go out to the creek bed and be detectives to figure out who was there before us. Now that you've seen Kiki's art demonstrations, it's time for you to use crayons, markers, paints, or model magic to create your art. Decide if you're going to make a woven camouflage biome scene or an animal footprint stamp. And after the kids finish their art, we suggest that parents and teachers help kids explore their ideas outdoors. See how nature extends the lessons as you look for camouflage and animal tracks, or do the art outdoors as Kiki is. Parents and teachers, please take a photo 
of the young artist's work and post it in the comment section of this video. We can't wait to see what they create. And while our viewers are finishing up their art, I want to share a special message with teachers and parents. You can enjoy more colorful learning experiences like this one by signing up to receive the Crayola Education free monthly e-newsletters. You'll receive updates on the next Art of Learning program and our other fun sessions delivered right to your email box. Kiki, naturally our viewers will want to stay connected with you to learn more. How can our viewers follow you on social media and continue to be inspired by your nature-based projects and animal fun facts? The best place to reach me is Instagram. So I post videos and pictures and all sorts of things about animals and wildlife on my Instagram. And my username is actually just my name, Kiki Myhawk at K-I-K-I-M-I-H-O-K. -I -I and that's where I share all that stuff. I do have a YouTube as well. It's under the same name and they can find me there. Kiki, your enthusiasm is contagious and your knowledge of animals and their habitats and behaviors is impressive. What closing comments do you want to share with viewers, urging them to continue to weave science and art together in their teaching and their learning? So my advice is to use your passion. It is a fire and just like a fire, when you add more and more to it and you feed it, it just grows and you feel more motivated. I encourage everybody to go where you feel a wind behind you and it just feels right and lean in that direction. Even if it's the smallest job that you can find, it's something you're interested in. My first job with animals was working at a dog boarding center and I was just happy to be around dogs. That's all I wanted was to find a way to be around some apes animals. So for me, I think that's the best advice is just to lean into your passion and don't let anybody tell you that you can't do what you feel like is right for you because you can and you will. And I believe in you if nobody else will, you can do it and you can just follow that passion and follow where you feel meant to go. Great advice. We want to thank Kiki Maiha for inspiring us today. And we want to thank the underappreciated animals for teaching us that every creature, including each of us, has superpowers. A special thanks to all of you who joined this Art of Learning. Bye, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.